Well, how many of you ladies were part of Inspire Conference the last couple of days? You know, it's one of those, if you missed it, I'm telling you, you missed it. I've heard great reports. There's some more things you're going to hear about. I'm so excited about the opportunity we get to be a part of this. Uh, such a big, big deal. It really is. I just want to tell you, uh, I'm honored that uh, this young lady, and uh, she's, you know, she's talking about how old she is, but she's still a lot younger than me. And uh, let me just tell you a little bit about Melinda Henderson. So I've known Melinda since she was just a little girl. Her dad and my dad were very good friends. Uh, in fact, her dad was my boss. He was our district youth director when I worked at camp. You've heard me talk about how God changed my life when I was working at camp, and I moved from a secular university and went back to Bible college and did, you know, followed my ministry. Well, he had a lot to do with that. And not only that, there's some other people here. Bill Sessions, you got saved on her dad's ministry. He's one of our great leaders. You know, I mean, that, I mean, and then uh, Karen Hawtom, and if you know Karen, her dad got saved under Howard, Howard Reynolds' ministry. So we got a connection here, more than you realize. So her family has a real part in what's happening in this house because uh, Brother Reynolds is uh, moving on and older and, and in life, but he, he has got a heritage, her and her family. And, and I just, I told her, I was joking with you yesterday, I said, I knew you were going to be a great leader because when you were like seven or eight, you were large and in charge. You already had that gift. <laughs> And so I'm telling you, I'm excited about today. We had a great weekend, and I know God has a word for this house. Get ready. If you already received the word of God, would you help me welcome Melinda Henderson? Hallelujah. Well, if you're going to stand for somebody, how about you just do it for Jesus? Will you give him a shout of praise in this house? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What an absolute honor, um, truly. I don't just say that. It's an honor um, to be on this platform today because Larry and I have pastored for 22 years, and I know what it is to give up the Sunday morning service um, when a special speaker is in town. And so I'm so grateful, Pastor Tom. Thank you. Um, not only for all the kind things you said, um, and I appreciate that, but thank you for believing um, in me today and allowing me to minister to your people. I'm grateful for that. Um, it, it was just an absolute incredible weekend. And I was, I was telling, and I know some of you missed it, and I pray that in the years to come you don't miss it because uh, there's no church that ever just wants to put events on the calendar, right? <laughs> Nobody just needs something else to do. But when we have an event, it's intentional that it's a spiritual marker in people's lives. I had the privilege, is like Pastor Tom said, growing up, I went to kids camp. How many of you have went to kids camp? Yeah. There you go. Okay, youth camp. How about youth conventions? Yep. Just keeps on going, right? Every one of those for me were spiritual markers in my life. I mean, it was a kids camp. I was filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I was at 14 at a youth convention for the state of Alabama when God called me to missions, and I answered an altar call. Those were spiritual markers in my life, and so many people nowadays, they don't have those spiritual markers, and it's so important that we have events specifically, whether it's children or youth or whether it's something for men, whether it's something for women and girls, but events that truly we just tarry in the presence of the Lord until he marks us spiritually. And I believe yesterday and Friday night, that's exactly what happened with Inspire. And it really was, Pastor Tom's already said this, but I can't thank the volunteers enough because my team comes in and can do what they do because of the local church and because of the volunteers. And I would have to say to you, Pam Turner, thank you. Because you came to the first one in Austria in 2018 and you saw the vision and your heart has been, God let that be what the women and girls of praise experience. And so I bless you today. Thank you for leading the charge and the vision. Will you just show some love to Pam Turner this morning? I um, Last night we got home from the event, and, and, you know, you're always exhausted physically, but spiritually you're just like an overflow. And, um, and so we sat down. All of these cards right here, are the testimony, these are the testimony cards that were written from this weekend. Do you see how many that is? There were 300 plus women and girls in the room. They came from all over. Baton Rouge, Tallahassee, Montgomery, they were here. And I just read a few of them to you because time will not allow me to do all of them. But this, the first one just says, I came here to this conference not expecting anything. 
Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, or I didn't know quite what to expect. That, it, that happens every time. People are like, what? Don't know what this is. Don't know if I'm going to show up. But the weight of brokenness was lifted. I came away from the conference feeling lighter. I'm no longer broken. I'm filled with hope. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. You never know what God is doing. My name is Anna Aguilar. Can I just say how wonderful this whole event has been? What a blessing. I come from a broken home, and it has caused me trust issues. But this weekend, I feel that I have closure. I needed that regarding the feelings of abandonment. They are no longer there, and I'm ready to share my story for the world to know Jesus. Hallelujah. I came Friday night really depressed and dry. I haven't been in the presence of the Lord in a very long time. God poured his love into me and he has healed my emotions. By Saturday afternoon, I felt like I haven't in a very long time rejoicing, praising, and I am thankful to have been a part of this weekend. Hallelujah. There's so many more, so many more I could read you. When I walked in the building, I was brought in with feelings of being alone, that I wasn't worthy. I no longer have that. I felt God has wiped away the past, given me a future. My experience from the Inspire event was a profound moment. That's what I'm talking about, a spiritual marker, one that you don't forget. Because emotions of life, trials up and down will come. And God needs to mark us sometimes spiritually so we have those cornerstones in our life that we look back to. That's what whoever this is said. My experience from Inspire was a profound moment. It has inspired me to be even more transparent with my journey so that my life story can help the next girl. And also I declare to have more boldness in standing in the person that God created me to be. Hallelujah. There's so many more I could read you and for time I won't do that. My name is Savannah. My story is still being written. God's called me to be a missionary. Hallelujah. Some of the youngest girls in the room, we told them, because I am, I, I love Praise Family. One of, I love you for a lot of reasons, right? But one of the things I love about this church is you're, you are so intentional with generational faith. Like you were intentional that we pass it on generation to generation to generation. And even at an event like this, we believe that the youngest girls should be in the room. They need to worship. They need to see their mamas worshiping. They need to see their grandmamas worshiping. They need to see their aunts speaking in their heavenly language. They need to hear that in close proximity. And this weekend, all the young girls were in the room with us. And when it came time and we told people if they had a story or testimony to write it out, we told the youngest girls in the room they could also write their stories. No, every story matters. And so I know, I don't know if you can see this, but just precious little picture that a little girl drew and she said, God loves me. That's all she wrote. That's all she wrote at the top. God loves me, right? That's a spiritual marker in her life that she'll remember this weekend. Wonderful other things. This one just says, yes, I can. Yes, I don't know. I don't. Or something like that. But a precious little card from Lily. God gave me and I worship. Hallelujah. God, I worship. You may say, Melinda, I don't clap as loud for those as I clap for the one that said I'm called to be a missionary. No, this is the next generation of the church. This is the next generation of the church. And from the youngest to the oldest, you've already heard Pastor Tom say that. Children, generations upon generations, we want to pass on our faith. It's an honor for me to bring you the word this morning and to share with you really part of an overflow from the weekend. And I... Larry and I have had the honor of being missionaries for 22 years. For 22 years, I didn't live in the U.S., right? I missed Koneka sausage, okay? I missed Eggo waffles. Those were at the top of my list when we came back. And you're like, Melinda, you're 52. You eat yet Eggos? Yes, I do. I love Eggos, okay? Don't judge me. I love Koneka sausage. I love Eggos. Yes, somebody else loves Koneka and Eggos. Thank you so much. For 22 years, we were in Europe, and last year, um, the Lord transitioned our assignment um, to now oversee. Um, there's 504 missionaries serving in 44 countries of Europe, and God transitioned our assignment to be the regional directors now. 
And so we had to move back to the U.S. And it's been a huge transition for me because I've only been living in the U.S. now 16 months after being gone 22 years. You guys, that's a shocker, okay? So I'm still trying to adjust to, to life and ministry in this new transition of our lives. And one of the things that I know that God's laid up on my heart is what started with Inspire in Austria in 2018. It's the mantle that God's asked me to carry here into the U.S., because we have so many of our people who are Christians who do not understand the importance of sharing your faith with the next person. Some of you have sat in church for years, raised on the pew, and yet you go to work like it's normal and you never speak of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with us to only come into the church on a Sunday, but not show up and be the church on a Monday, on a Tuesday, on a Wednesday, when the world needs us. And I believe that's probably the biggest mantle that God's asked me to carry as I travel and as I'm allowed to speak and minister. Because I believe that in the word, we've been mandated by God to live a life intentionally on mission. Not just going on missions, and going is wonderful when you go on a trip, but I want you to understand, you are on a life trip for Jesus every day. You are on a mission trip every day. If you're at the ballpark with your kids, if you're at work, if you're sitting in the classroom, wherever you are, you are on a mission for Jesus. Because we only have two choices. Either we believe he's coming back or we don't. And if we believe he's coming back, then why would we not tell the people around us? The latest statistics show that 94 to 96 percent, you can look this up, Google this, okay? Melinda's not making this up. 94 to 96 percent of Christians who sit in our U.S. churches have never shared their faith with one person. Just let that sink in in silence for a few seconds. 94 to 96% of us that think we can come to church on Sunday and the worship's great and it's wonderful and we have coffee and we talk to people and then we leave and never take that message with us. I want you to understand that when you come into the Father's house on a Sunday, it is so that the Holy Spirit pours into you so that when you walk out of here, you pour out into the world. It was never meant to be a selfish, self-centered faith. God, fill me. God, heal me. God, 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 I need this. I need this. I need that. But God pours into you so that you are overflowing and you know how to pour out. That is the purpose, the intentionality that as believers in Christ Jesus, he's put us on mission. And I tell you this morning, praise family, and those of you watching, missions has to be normal. Missions is normal. We're not living for our house. We're not living for our jobs. You're not even living for your family as much as they mean to you. And my family means everything to me. My husband, my kids, my grandkids, they mean everything to me. But at the end of the day, when I stand before the Lord, it is one thing only that will matter. And that is how did I use my life so that the next person came to know the hope that is only found in the name of Jesus. I can give people a meal. I can feed them. I can do hospitality. But unless people know Jesus, we are missing the point of why you and I accepted him. Yeah. Missions has to be normal. You and I are on a corporate assignment as the church. A corporate assignment as the church that this assignment says go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples. It's a mandate that says you are the light set on a hill that should not be hidden. There's a mandate that says you're the salt of the earth. You know what salt is for? Salt is to bring a little seasoning. 
You need to read that in the message version. It's one of my favorites because it says you are the salt seasoning that God has placed upon the earth. And if you lose your saltiness, you're useless for nothing. That's what the Message Bible <laughs> translates that. It's really incredible. We have a mandate by God. It's not optional to share our faith. It's not optional to not be on mission. I would ask you in here this morning, and I want you to be bold because we are a family. How many of you have someone in your family that still does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Raise your hand quickly, hi, quickly, hold it up. At least 50% of us or more. That's your family. Your family. How many of you long to see the day where they all come to Jesus? That's the reason we're living, so that every knee will understand, every person will understand that they are created in the image of God. We are missional at our core. That is our responsibility. And maybe you say, but Belinda, I've tried to witness to my family. See, that's the problem. We're trying to witness. Just live a lifestyle that is the witness. That's our biggest mistake. I, I, I'm so honest. I hope y'all love me because if you don't, then, man, I'll never come back, okay? But I am one of the most honest speakers you will ever hear because I'm just going to talk to you like I would everybody. Some of the biggest mistakes we make as Christians is we try to witness. We're like, okay, oh, okay, Jesus, I'm going to wait right here. I'm going to be right here when my coworker comes in to get coffee. Okay, Holy Spirit. Okay, okay, okay. I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be ready. No, just live normal. I said it in the first service, and I'll say it again. We have too many Christians that act crazy. That's a whole message in itself, right? I heard you say preach that. We have too many, too many Christians that don't just act normal. Just act normal. You are a normal person. You woke up this morning, had your coffee. Some of you had breakfast. Some of you didn't. Some of you rushed out of the house. Some of you didn't. We're just normal people. But if we will live our life with an intentionality that everywhere we go, to everyone we meet, they should sense there is something in us. And there will be opportunities when we speak, and there will be opportunities when we don't even need to speak. But our life is a witness before all men. The problem is, on top of the other problem, is that because so many Christians are not living with the fruit of the Spirit in their life, they are not the witness that they need to be. That's a whole other message, right? I got five messages inside this message. But we have to be a people of God who understand that our daily life is to be surrendered with, to Jesus every day. That we are intentional, that we are full of his spirit, that the fruits of the spirit are being produced in our life. So that wherever we go, we carry the presence of Jesus. We carry his anointing up on us. Wherever we go, we walk into the room and people sense that something is different. You don't have to tell them, hey, I'm a Christian. They should know it. They should know it. And you say, I'm Linda, how are they going to know it if I don't tell them? They will know it by the way you treat them, by the way they watch, they watch you treat your family by the way you talk in front of them, by the way you're kind to them, people will know. You don't have to say a word. And I want you to understand this morning that our life is not our own. And that's the, that's the lie that the enemy has wanted us to buy into for so long that our life can just be lived however we want it to be. I'm going to do my own thing today. I'm going to make my own schedule today. No, your life, when you surrendered your heart to Jesus, you surrendered your selfish will to him as well. And you said, Jesus, I'm yours. I'm yours. Use me, God. But we forget over time, and life gets busy, right? Life gets busy. Families have schedules. Families have struggles. We have stresses. We have all these things that mount up on us, and we totally forget 
the entire purpose of our life. But I speak to you this morning from the youngest one in the room to the oldest. God has placed his hand upon you. You have purpose. And God is asking you this morning, will you refocus to understand what are priorities and what do you need to let go of? There are priorities in your life that are taking the place of the main priority, and that is being light and salt to this earth. Missions is not optional. Missions has to be normal. Reaching the next person with the love of Jesus has to be normal. Some of you in this room, I can't imagine what your stories would be. Some of you have been raised in church all along. I, I was, like Pastor Tom said, I was, I was a pastor's kid, preacher's kid. I love the church. I love the Lord. Some of you, though, probably have stories of brokenness. We heard just amazing stories this weekend of people that come from abusive homes, alcoholic homes, abandonment, and how God has rewritten their story because someone showed up on mission. But see, God uses his people to help rewrite the stories of the next one that needs to know him. He uses you How amazing is that, right? I don't know what the youngest one is in this room. I see some young people like right here on this third row. So I'm just guessing. Is somebody 10? How old is she? 11. Okay, I got two 11-year-olds. Anybody beat that? Anybody younger than 11? Okay, so anybody over 80? Hallelujah. Okay, so look at this praise family. From the 11-year-old to the 80-plus, God has purpose over our lives purpose. And the Bible says as long as we have breath to breathe, you can wake up every morning and understand that you are on mission for Jesus, sir. You are on mission for Jesus, young lady. You are on mission for Jesus today, tomorrow, next week. I don't know, but the trumpet hasn't sounded yet because had it had, I would be gone. So if it hasn't sounded yet, we still have a mission to do. And that's to show up in this world for Jesus. John 9, 4 says, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Because night is coming when no one can work. How many of you have gardens? Anybody had a garden? It's almost the season is coming to an end, right? You change out little winter garden stuff. No one goes out and picks their garden at night when they can't see. You go to your garden normally before the sun goes down. You get, and, and that same illustration God's using here in John 9, 4 is, look, night is coming. But as long as it's day, we've got to go out and gather the harvest that God's already prepared for us. And the Bible says the harvest is plentiful. There's people in your workplace that want to know Jesus. Guess what? There's a neighbor living on your street that wants to know Jesus. And it's your responsibility to go gather the harvest that God has placed within your influence. Because right now it's still light, but darkness is coming. And once darkness comes, you can't reach your neighbor anymore. You can't reach your sister anymore. You can't reach the person you sit beside in class anymore. We work now because missions is normal. What's the mission? To tell the whole world that Jesus is the answer. We don't have to complicate missions. Just tell people that Jesus is the answer. This is old school song. Right? So anybody over 50, because I'm 52, so anybody over 50 would know Jesus is the answer for the world today. Anybody younger than 50 know that song? Oh, it's because you've been raised in church. Jesus is the answer. There you go. We better stop there before it gets bad, okay? (laughs) Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. What? Jesus is the way. That is the mission. Jesus is the way. There's no other name greater than the name of Jesus. We put it into wonderful worship this morning, and now we have to walk that mission out in our life that to tell the whole world that Jesus is the answer. 
that Jesus redeems, that Jesus restores families, that Jesus heals the broken hearted, that Jesus can take you from the worst sin in your life and rewrite your story into a beautiful chapter, that Jesus is the only way to heaven, that Jesus, no other name greater than the name of Jesus. That is our mission to take it to the whole world. Missions has to be normal. It has to be part of who we are. I don't know about you, but how many woke up this morning and you wanted coffee? How many of you? What do the rest of you drink? Tea? Are you tea people? Hot tea? You wake up to water? Y'all make me feel terrible. I'm talking about Eggos and Koneka, and now you're talking about drinking water when you wake up. Uh, milk? Okay. All right. Y'all just stop right there. Look. I got to have my two cups of coffee every morning, right? Some of you wake up. You don't want anybody to talk to you until let me, let me have at least one cup minimum. My motto in my house is give me two cups of coffee. Please don't engage me in any conversation. Every season's different, right? When I had little kids, I didn't have that privilege. Now, thank God, I'm an empty nester and I love this season of life. It's awesome. So I'll take all that quiet time in the morning, have my two cups of coffee. And look, as much as we laugh about that, being on mission for Jesus should be as normal as waking up and having a cup of coffee in the morning. But yet we make it seem so odd and so strange and like we don't know what to say to people. Be normal. Be you. Live life with people. See people. That's one of of the greatest things that we could do as a church is just don't live with such tunnel vision. That all you see in the morning is your agenda and your schedule. Because that's the greatest trick of the enemy. He he takes us away from the divine appointments that God has you for because you are so tunnel vision to what you have to get done. And you don't even see the people that God puts right beside you. When you when you go to a doctor's appointment, I shared part of this with the ladies yesterday. It's not about just going to the doctor. Who else is in that waiting room? Who's the nurses? Who's the doctor? Be on mission. When you go to the grocery store, it's not just about your groceries. Ask Jesus to give you eyes to see the way the Spirit sees. There may be someone coming down the aisle at the same time you are, and you need to be prepared to be kind, to speak a word of life to them. Missions has to be an overflow every day in our life. That to reach the world for Jesus must be our greatest priority because it is a mandate from God himself. Not an option. If you belong to Jesus, then you are mandated to share the good news. You say, Melinda, that sounds terrible. Well, I'm sorry, then let it sound terrible. But it's God's word. If you love him, why in the world would you not want to be on mission every day and make sure that the whole world knows him? I don't want any. God says he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Every one of us, no matter who we are, God died for us. God died for your neighbor. And we have to make it so normal to give, to go, to send, to be on mission today, tomorrow, next week, next month. We give, we go, we be on mission. Every day, everywhere we go, let the Spirit of God go with you. Understand that you see those around you. Could you imagine what would happen at Praise Family? I don't know how many people are in here, but it was a packed first service, packed second service. Could you imagine if each of you would say, God, let me live on mission? If you would live on mission for one week, I'm not talking about make a year commitment. Make a seven-day commitment to say, God, every morning I wake up, let me be on mission. Don't let me have tunnel vision that I don't see the opportunities. Could you imagine if each of you just reached one person for Jesus in the next week, next year? Say if over the next year you reached one person with the good news. Could you imagine? You wouldn't just be having two services. You'd be having four services. Or you'd be wanting a bigger building budget. Okay, we got to blow out some walls. Shouldn't that be what we want? God never asked us to maintain his church. 
He never said, go into all the world and entertain my family. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. Preach the news. Preach the good news. He said, be light until everyone, everyone has had the opportunity to know about the love of Jesus. If you're in this room today, you say, Melinda, I'm not even living for Jesus myself. I know there's sin in my life. Maybe you walked in here today and this is all sort of new to you. You've never accepted Jesus. Can I just tell you, the Heavenly Father invites you to know him now, today. It's not magical prayers that have to be prayed over you. It just is a repentant heart to say, Jesus, forgive me. I, for, I ask you to forgive me of my sins and come into my life. It is that simple prayer, and then you will be saved. If that's you today, I just want to encourage you. At the end of this service, they'll have a prayer time down here. Come and speak with someone that you no longer want to live a life of sin, but you want to live a life surrendered to Jesus. For the rest of you that are in here and you've been serving Jesus for a long time, I would just tell you, may you take this message today. May it be more than just words that are spoken, but may it be something that you just sense to your core that God, forgive me that I've been so concerned about my own life, my own problems, that I don't even see the circle of influence that you're placing in my life every day. Because this is the beautiful thing. One day we're going to get to heaven, right? One day we're going to get to heaven. I heard one, people, one person say yes. I'm going. Anybody else want to go? Okay. One day we're going to get to heaven and walk in. And I, I don't want Jesus to just say, okay, Melinda, come on. Okay, you accepted me, so come on in. I, I want to hear him say, Melinda, well done. But you will not hear him say, well done, if you don't do well. So if you want to hear the well done, then you got to get up every day and say, God, I want to do well for your kingdom today. I want to go to heaven, and when I get there, I want to see that you say, Melinda, welcome, but look, they're here, and they're here, because you inspired that one to follow Jesus, and that one, and then he inspired her, and then she inspired him, and one by one by one, heaven was full, full. I want to hear him say, well done. When we started the Inspire Project, we were in Austria. Larry and I, our kids were living in Vienna at the time. And 2017, I really, we had an amazing church, Vienna Christian Center, Tom Pam, Pastor Tom Pam, a few others. I think Miss Deborah, a few of you have been there in service on a Sunday. Lori, I think you went too one year, 2018. Just amazing church, Vienna Christian Center, 100 plus nations represented in one church. Okay, we had services, 13 services every weekend. You take that. <laughs> you talk about being a little crazy. We had language, I mean, translations, multiple services in different languages, huge pastoral team because we all had to do different languages. So we had a French-speaking pastor, a Spanish-speaking pastor, German-speaking pastor. And the church was incredible, but my heart as a missionary was every time we would have these awesome services. I mean, they were amazing. People got saved every service. And we had services all day Saturday, all day Sunday to get them all in on the weekend. And it was incredible. But my heart was, the church may be awesome. It may be a few thousand people. But when you go out into the city, Austria is a nation of 9 million plus people. As a missionary, I could not be content with who was in the church. My heart had to beat for those that were not in yet. My heart still had to see the city of no one, no matter how amazing this is, Jesus. You didn't call us to just do this. You called us to reach those who were still lost, reach those who were still hurting. And I really felt the Lord gave me the dream. I woke up one morning and I was like, I really sensed. God just said, Melinda, who, who do you have influence with? And I knew it was with the women and girls of our church. We had never done any type conference because I honestly was not a big women's ministry person. I loved gathering women and girls. I loved encouraging them. But I'd never done much as far as women's ministries. And I woke up that morning and I really just, the Lord, I started writing it all out because I felt like the Lord was telling me, this is what you're going to do. 
this is going to be the annual plan. I went to Larry. I said, babe, I just feel like this is what the Lord's told me to do because I, I, I want the women and girls of our church to understand that they have to live on mission. The services are awesome, but I want to see their friends come to Jesus. And so I, he told me, he said, Melinda, I love it. I think, it, I think, yeah, let's just pray over it. We prayed for a few weeks. He told me, he said, and let's meet with the key leaders. You need to explain to them what you want, what do you want to see. I met with all of them. They were so skeptic. I just can't tell you. They were like, we've never done that before. I'm like, I know, but just trust me. And if it fails, blame me, okay? But if it doesn't fail, then I want you to know that God's with us. And this is what we're supposed to do in this city. We have to reach the lost. And what happened was that first year, amazing, second year, third year. By the third year, the multiplication was just crazy numbers. And I'm not going to tell you numbers because I don't want anybody to ever think I'm bragging. It was just really, it's, it's what we're supposed to be doing normally anyway. It's nothing special. It's just reaching people that need Jesus. By that third year, a missionary friend who was pastoring in Scotland called me and she said, Melinda, what I see you doing with the women and girls in Austria, like we need that in Scotland. And I was like, okay, we'll help you. So we went and helped her. I said, okay, well, then we got to get organized. We put a checklist together. The next missionary friend called me in Fiji, and she said, Melinda, we want it in Fiji. Will you come help us start? And I was like, yes, of course we can. And so we are now only, we've just completed our fifth year. We have one more, and that's in Budapest, Hungary next month in November. And we'll finish out the year. Next year, we have Inspire events in 14 countries for 2025, right? <laughs> For 2025, there's already five countries that I've added to that list, but I told them I just don't, I can't, I don't have a big enough team to do 19 next year. So we'll do 19 in 2025, and I got to pray in the meantime, God builds our team. Because I'm saying yes to things we're not capable of doing yet, but I know it's by faith. This year, we were in Iceland in April, and I had never been to Iceland. Anyone been? Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Oh, yeah, I saw y'all's trip. Yes, I saw some of that. Okay, so Iceland, never been. It's a cold country. Churches are tiny, small. They, we went to Iceland, and we were in the capital city, and we were at a Hilton um, hotel at using their conference room. And um, I watched a hotel worker. She would come stand in the back, and then she, then she would walk out. You see her standing right here. You see this picture? And I would see her, and she told one of the workers, one of the volunteers, she said, I feel good vibes here. And, like, that's the only way she knew to explain it. She felt good vibes. And she'd come back in, then she'd run do her work so she wouldn't get in trouble, then she'd come back in again. And by the third session that she came in, I told one of our volunteers, I was like, don't just let her stand there. Like, go explain to her that it's not good vibes that she's feeling. It's called the presence of Jesus. And he's reaching out to her. Ask her, just normal, if she wants to ex receive Jesus. Of course, they went. They did it. Everything we do is a training moment, like teaching people to make it normal. She accepted Jesus, and this is the picture you see of her at the end of that Saturday holding her very first Bible. Never had a Bible. I'm not talking about 20, right? <laughs> to God be the glory, right? <laughs> this next picture you see is Fiji. We went, to, we went to Fiji. There was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I mean, just phenomenal. This was in July of this year. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And in one of the sessions, because we truly believe that you don't have to shy away from being Pentecostal. Every, we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need the gifts of the Spirit. We need it flowing in our churches. And we just knew that the Holy Spirit was moving. I can't tell you. I don't know. Friday night, this whole section was full of women and girls who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Numerous. Because that is a spiritual marker that will change them. And musicians can come. I'm wrapping this up. After that session, we were in Fiji and just outpouring presence of the Holy Spirit. And we knew that a word of knowledge, just like you did, Pastor Tom, earlier. We knew that a word of knowledge was given, that God was going to heal a brain tumor. 
Well, first it was a tumor, and I knew the Lord said, Melinda, specifically, it's a brain tumor. And I was like, oh, Jesus, like, if I say that and it's not true, you know, because that's the flesh of you, right? The flesh of us says, if I say that, Lord, like, it's not true. But I just said, you got to walk by faith and not by sight. So I was like, okay, we're going we're gonna to call this out, Lord. And we called out. We said, look, God wants to heal a tumor. And whoever is in the room specifically, we feel, God, it's, it's a brain tumor. This lady welled out crying, jumped to her feet, and I said, if you'll make your way down here, the Lord's going to heal you. Supernatural healing. Women gathered around her. We prayed against the tumor. Not only did she go to the doctor a month later, but she received a report that said the tumor had stopped and the tumor is now shrinking, that it is no longer affecting her life. In Wells, the last one I'll show you is we went to Wells, never been to Wells either. I was in a little tiny Welch community called Glenneth. It was about 15 minutes to where the Welch revival broke out. Found out that there was a drug rehab center not far from the church. And I said, please just invite every girl there to come. We'll sponsor them to come. And this is, you're seeing this. This is Kathleen and this is Sandra. Both gave their hearts to Jesus, both standing there with their very first Bible. This is what it means. And if the musicians will come, I want to wrap this up and I want to challenge you, church. Night is coming when no one else can know Jesus. But as long as it's day, we have to make missions normal. You have to. We have to. We have to break the statistic of 94% of us who don't share our faith. And you may say, Melinda, but I am scared to death. Like, I, I don't know the Bible. I haven't memorized it. Can I tell you? Just start. You know, like, my husband wants me to learn how to drive a stick shift. How many of you drive a stick shift? Okay. Okay. See, y'all make me feel bad. My goodness. I got, I got to call Larry now and say, okay, I'll learn. And I was like, I'm 52. Like, I've been driving an automatic. I'm fine. He's like, but Melinda, you just need to know the skill. And I'm like, okay. It's like some of you, when you first started washing clothes, you had to learn that not everything goes in one load. I'm still trying to teach that to some of my adult kids. That when they come to my house, you don't push everything in the washing machine. But you had to learn. I'm just thankful they're washing their clothes. They'll learn how to do it right. Some of you, the same thing with cooking. All right? Some of you are such terrible cooks, you don't even walk in the kitchen anymore. Right? Some of you are great. But some of you started bad, and now you're wonderful. But it's all about learning. First time you sat behind the wheel of a car, you had to learn. Sharing your faith gets easier the more you do it because it becomes natural. It becomes the normal to your every day. I am looking for people to witness to. We were at a leader's luncheon on Friday at Wenzel's. We were in the private room and there was a young lady that was serving us. Alana was her name. We just started talking when she came in the room and we're just leaning up against the wall. Then all of a sudden she starts telling every lady there just what it means for her to be there with us, how kind we've been to her. So I just said, Alana, I just feel like God's placed you at this restaurant on purpose. And we just want to pray over you. Yo, you guys were there. We made it normal. Normal. If you're going to a restaurant today, just open your eyes to see that it's more than about the menu. It's about the people God's placed around you. Let's live on mission, church. Your family needs to know Jesus. Your co-workers need to know Jesus. People around you and your neighborhood need to know Jesus. And guess what? what? God says you're capable of reaching them. But you just got to be normal. Normal. And you know why I say, Melinda, don't you say that enough? Not really. I have to drill it in because just too many Christians get weird. Like you don't have to take them down the Roman road to salvation. 
You just need to live out Jesus in front of people. Be ready. Don't be afraid. If they make fun of you, so what? People mocked Jesus. How on earth should we feel like we deserve better treatment than the one who gave his life for us? If people make fun of us, they make fun of us. But guess what? Those that will find Jesus, it'll be worth every mockery. Would you stand with me all over this place? I want to pray over you. I really sense that there's an awakening, not just for Praise Family Church, but I believe for the church in America, that God is doing awakening, that we've come to church too long and made it all about us. We've come to church for too long and wondered, can we get our coffee? Can we get out on time? Do I like the song choices? Are the lights just right? Does she preach too long or, I mean, right? We're terrible, the American church. And God is just saying, he's coming and he's put you on assignment. And today, wherever you go, tomorrow, wherever you go, be Jesus to somebody, be kind. Kindness will open the doors to more witnessing than you could ever imagine because the world is full of rude people. And when you're kind, you stand out. Isn't that awesome? So just be kind to people. If they don't deserve it, be kind anyway. God gave us grace that we don't deserve. He saved us. We didn't merit it, but he gave it to us and we give it to people because Jesus died for people. If you want to be used on an assignment by God, would you just lift your hand and I pray right now. Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for your word. God, I thank you that you've mandated us, that Jesus, you are coming back for your church. And Lord, we don't want to make our faith all about us, but we want to make it about the next one that is still waiting to know that there is hope, that there is a true answer to life's meaning, and that is Jesus. Father, I pray over this house specifically today, over Praise Family, God, that you will do a stirring within them to live on mission that missions has to be a normal part of their everyday life. And I pray, God, a multiplication upon this church. I pray that hundreds in this community over the coming years will come to Jesus because Praise Family made missions normal every day, everywhere, every job, every school, every department store, that we are on mission for Jesus. God, we thank you that you count us worthy to be used. And we say, oh God, will you reach the next one through us? Ask Jesus. God, do it through me. May someone find you through me. In Jesus' mighty name, shout a big amen in this house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope you'll tune in next time. If you want more information about Praise Family Church, or if you think you might like to visit us sometimes, you can find out a lot of information at Praise Family. Dot church. Maybe you'd like to partner with us to make these broadcasts possible. You can text the word giving to 313131 or you can mail an offering to the address you see on the screen. But whatever you do, we want to continue to be a blessing to you. We want to be a help to you and we want to let you see that God has got great things in store for you and he has a plan for your life. We hope you'll continue to tune in and you'll be a part as Praise Family Church continues to tell the good news around the world.